Good morning, Cross Point. It is, it is great to be back. Uh, like Tammy, uh, I wonder where summer has gone. Uh, it's just flown by. But uh, I am glad to be here, excited to be here. And uh, I hear big news. Uh, and Chad is going to be starting here in a couple weeks, and uh, that is exciting. And uh, I have prayed for your church, and um, I'm just excited. I don't know him personally, but um, here's what I do know. I do know that I think this is my fifth or sixth time being here. I first came back in January. Um, I see the hand of God working in your church. And uh, Chad coming here, um, my prayer is just that uh, God would use him, that this church would continue just to reach people here in Maysville and even have a ministry and an influence in the state of Kentucky, in our country, and even around the world. So I am excited about that. I am proud of you. You guys have something here that is rare. And uh, this morning, I just want to say a quick prayer and just pray for that transition and uh, pray for our time together, and then we're going to jump into our teaching time. Okay, let's, let's go to God. Hey, God, I, I just pray that you pour your spirit out upon Cross Point Community Church. And Father, with this transition that's coming, Chad is going to be coming, and he's going to be leading, and I just pray that the staff, the leadership, and the influence, and what you're doing here in Maysville will just continue, and you will just continue to work through this church. And Father, uh, I see this, this lives are being changed, and I see the effects of, of what you've done, and I just pray that it would continue. And uh, Father, that they would be able to continue as a church to just keep their eyes focused on you, and trust you, and know that you will continue to use them to do great things, Father. And we all say this and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Things have changed. Maybe um, you've noticed that. I have definitely noticed that in my lifetime. And I'm 49 years old, so I'm kind of revealing my age. But things have changed. How I find out information has changed in my lifetime. Some of you that are my age or a little older, can you kind of relate to that? I mean, if you're younger, maybe you don't get that, but how I search for things, how I find things has changed. When, when I was in elementary school and I had to find out the third vice president of the United States, that meant that I probably had to go to the library and I, or I probably had to go find a book and I probably had to go look it up. If someone said, how far is it from uh, Houston, Texas to Chicago, Illinois? Like, well, I guess I got to go get an atlas. And I get an atlas, and, you know, you can kind of measure it. It, like, you know, 100 miles is this much, and you take your ruler, and you kind of figure that out, and, and, and you could just, you know, find out those things. If you wanted to find out, um, like, how many casualties there were in, in World War II, my parents had these things called encyclopedias. You remember those? Some of you remember that? Like we had them on the shelf. I think we paid like $1,000 for them. They were like our family's prized possession. And we had them stacked up and there was A, B, C, D, and they went all the way through there. And so you'd go through there and you'd pick it up and you'd open it up and you'd look for it and you'd, and you'd find it and that's how you found out your information. This is fascinating. Well, today, it doesn't work that way, does it? I mean, today, that's not how we search for things. If we want to know something, you don't do that. Now, today, there's this thing called the Internet, and there's this company called Google, and they have basically become the default way of searching for anything that you want to know, right? And we even turn it into a verb, and we tell people to Google it. I mean, you probably have sarcastic people in your life, and when, when you ask a dumb question, they're like, I don't know, Google it. Just Google it. I mean, you can find out anything. I mean, you want to know how many, you know, liters are converted to ounces. You want to know what this word means in Spanish. You want to know anything you want to know, even stuff you don't want to know and things you didn't even know you needed to know. People say, Google it. Now, I have to tell you, one of my pet peeves is when somebody is with me, like, I, I, the context is in a car. I'm driving through a busy city downtown trying to find my way, and I have people in the car, my wife, my kids, my parents, asking questions with their cell phone in their hand. You know, like, I wonder what the temperature in Anchorage, Alaska is today. And I'm like, Google it. I mean, you got your phone right there, right? Uh, is it going to rain on Thursday? Google it. I mean, you can find anything you want to know, any, any capacity. You just put it in your smartphone, put it in your laptop, put it in your tablet, put it in your computer, and it's all there. And you know what? For the most part, it's a better world that we have all of that information at our fingertips. Today, though, we're going to talk about how do I find 
God's will for my life? How do I search to know if God has a plan for my life? And I have these questions in my life. I'm not sure what to do or how to proceed. And I, I want to know God's input on it. How do I do that? Well, here's the bad news. You can't Google it. Y you can't really do that. It doesn't work that way with God's will. You can't type in your browser, Hey God, should, uh, should I take that job in Columbus, Ohio and move my family there? Like, y you won't get a response. You can't say, uh, Hey Siri, uh, should I marry this girl? I mean, should I put a ring on it? Should she not, you know, maybe is this the real thing? She's going to say, I don't know what you're talking about. Here I found a, for, a few searches for put a ring on it. And she'll say something dumb like that. You can't say, hey Alexa, uh, my husband's a real jerk and I'm thinking about uh, maybe I should leave. Um, is that a good idea or not? You can't do that when it comes to God's will. You can't do that when it comes to the real deep questions in our life that sometimes we're looking for answers to. You can't just Google it. And like many of you, I want to be a person who's so in tune with God that, that I can easily hear him and respond to him and, and do his will. Now here's the great news this morning. God cares about you. God has a plan for your life. And God wants you to know what that plan is. That is great news but you're never going to find that in Google. It just can't help you. So this morning, what we're going to do is we're going to look at a passage of Scripture in the Old Testament. And uh, for some of you that have grown up in church, it's, it's a couple verses that you may be familiar with, but we're going to look at them today in the context of God's will and searching for it. And here's what we're going to see. We're going to see three steps and a promise in this passage, and I'll tell you what it is in just a moment. And then we're going to break down the aspects or the components of God's will to, to kind of, the goal for today is to help us answer this question, if God has a will for my life, how do I find out what it is? And, and I want to do God's will. I mean, most of you are probably in that room. A lot of us would say, yeah, I want to do. If God has this plan for my life, I, I want to, because I believe, personally, I believe deep down that, that the best way to live is right in the center of God's will. But sometimes that is, can be difficult to figure out and navigate. So that's what we're going to talk about today. So if you have a Bible and you brought it with you, turn to the book of Proverbs, chapter 3. Book of Proverbs, it's in the Old Testament. If you go to your Bible, you open it up, and you get to the middle, and you're at Psalms, you take a right, and you should be at Proverbs. We'll also have some verses up on the screen. Uh, but a little background about that. Proverbs is an Old Testament book that's a collection of wise sayings, and uh, it's principles to live by. And they were written by a man named Solomon who was supposedly the wisest man in, that ever lived, and he was a king in Israel. And what I want us to see this morning is that we're going to find out that God's will is not as mysterious and as elusive as what we make it to be. That God does have a plan for our life. We are the ones that complicate that plan. We are the ones that make knowing God's will much more complicated, and I'll get into more of that in just a moment. So I'm going to read Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, before we kind of break it down and, and break it into steps. But here's what Solomon writes to us, and you may have heard this before. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your paths straight. So the first step, very easy. Solomon says, for you and I, part of finding God's will is to trust in the Lord with all, all, all of our heart. Now, I like what Rick Warren says. He's a pastor in Southern California, and he says, if you think God is your co-pilot, you are in the wrong seat. Okay, because God is really not our co-pilot. If we're searching for God's will, God should be the one who is driving our lives. We should be the ones that just scoot over, put God in control, and if we want to find God's will, to trust him with all of our heart. Like, pedal to the metal, everything. God, I will trust you. I won't question. I'll just, I will believe that you have the right plan. Now, do you ever wish some things weren't in the Bible? I mean, I do. I, I wish there were things that weren't in the Bible. And for me, the word all, I wish wasn't in there. Because it would be a whole lot easier. It would be a whole lot easier if Solomon wrote to us, trust in the Lord with most of your heart. Trust in the Lord with the majority of your heart. Trust in the Lord with a good part of your heart. But it says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. And part of finding God's will is saying, God, I will trust you with 
all my heart. I will trust you and believe. I will go pedal to the metal. I will not lift up. I will not back down. I will just believe and know that if I want to know your will, that I will give it everything that I have. And in that, then I will begin to find God's will. So I want you to watch up on the screen, and we're going to show a movie clip from a famous movie that some of you may have seen before. A blast from the past. hits 88 miles per hour. You're going to see some serious... What I love about that movie clip, and some of you, uh, you know that that's from Back to the Future, and if you're younger, you may have never seen that movie before. But what I loved about that movie was they realized that the DeLorean had to go 88 miles an hour, right? It had to go that. It couldn't go 87. It couldn't go 86. It couldn't go 80. It couldn't even just go the speed limit. It had to go 88 miles an hour. And, and so they had to take it, and they had to give it all the gas, and it was pedal to metal, and it was just like, it was... It's, it's all that had to happen. It, it, it wouldn't have occurred. They couldn't travel in time unless they could get the DeLorean to go 88 miles an hour. Well, for you and I to find God's will in our lives, it's Him with all of our heart. All. Not part, not most, not, not a majority. All. And that's a hard thing to do. It's easier to, for me to say it than it is to do it. But finding God's will is trusting Him with all of our heart. And that's the very first step all of our heart. Second step, Solomon says, and lean not on your own understanding. Now, we think we're pretty smart people. I mean, I think I'm a pretty smart guy. You're obviously a, a smart group of people. So that's hard for us because we think, well, hold, I mean, I got a brain. I'm smart. I can figure things out. I'm self-sufficient. I'm educated. I know I can do these things. But God doesn't see things like we see things. He sees them differently than we do. And so our stumbling block many times for finding God's will is the fact that we won't fully lean into Him. We want to lean back on our own understanding. Pastor Randy Frazee has a story where he talks about this. I want you to watch on the screen a short clip, and he's going to tell you that story and how it relates to God's will. Watch this. As a young pastor, uh, my wife and I uh, started to have children. We had four in all. But when our second one came along, his name is David, uh, when he came out, we saw immediately that he was born without a left hand. And uh, my wife seemed to accept this uh, a lot easier than I did, but it was extremely devastating to me. Matter of fact, I thought to myself, you know, God, um, everywhere I look, people that don't follow you, I even go to the zoo, and everyone has two feet and two hands. Uh, have I not been faithful to you? What are you doing to me? I really, uh, really uh, struggled with the whole idea. Uh, that was 25 years ago. Uh, today, my son is married to a beautiful, beautiful woman. Uh, he is in his second year of law school. He loves God in a very, very deep way. And what God has shown me 25 years later is that uh, uh, we don't need two hands. What we really need is Him. And when we have Him, we can rise above all the things that the world tells us that we need uh, to have a successful and fulfilled life. Uh, and we can rely completely on Him. My son David, born without a hand, all these 25 years, is an absolute miracle of God for me. My life and your life is full of things that will happen and we'll go, why God? Like, well, hold on, maybe it's because of this, maybe it's because of that. Maybe, maybe I figured it out, maybe this is it or that's it or maybe this is the answer. And God said, if you want to know my will, 
lean not on your own understanding. D don't try to figure it out. Don't, have, don't make it to where you have to come up with an explanation. It can just be a God thing. Because we can't lean into what makes sense to us. We can't always just find a, our culture is, tells us something is acceptable or not acceptable, or this is the answer, or this is the reason why that's happened. You have to trust in the Lord. It means you have to be obedient in the ways that don't always make sense to you and I. It doesn't always add up. We're not always sure what God is doing. And he's working in our lives, and if you want to find his will, you can't lean on your own understanding. You have to just be willing to go, okay, God, I totally trust you. We already talked about that. Now, I'm, I'm not going to lean in to my understanding, but I'm just going to believe that you have a bigger plan that doesn't necessarily, I can't, it doesn't always add up to me, and I don't understand it right now, but I'm going to trust you anyway. If you think of characters in the Bible, Moses was told by God, I want you to take the staff, Moses, and I want you to throw it on the ground. That's a dumb thing to do. Like, why would I throw my stick on the ground? I mean, then I gotta bend down and pick it up. What is that going to prove? It's just a stick. What is what does a stick and putting it on the ground have to do with this guy? Why would you ask me to do something? There, there's bit, there's things that need to be done. Time is of the essence. Why this? Moses throws it down and it turns into a serpent. And all of a sudden he's amazed. He sees God do this this miraculous thing that he didn't understand, he didn't get, he couldn't quite, he didn't have a category for it. Joshua thought that marching around the, the city of Jericho, like, why would you do that? Why would you get a band and have a parade and march around the town? Like, what, what is that going to do? And yet, he did it, and he led the people, and the walls started crumbling and falling down. Then there was Noah. God said, I want you to build a big boat, size of a football field. Anybody been out to the, the one here in Kentucky and seen that? few of you, yeah, I, I've yet to do that. That's something I want to do. But people were like, no, that's crazy. Why, why are you, that doesn't make any sense. It had never rained before. Like, why are you going to build a boat on dry land until it started raining? And then all of a sudden it was like, okay, God, you, you're doing something that I don't quite understand. If I lean into my own understanding, it doesn't make sense. But God has this beautiful way of doing things that we don't always get and we can't always see. And here's why it's important not to lean into our own understanding, but to trust him with all of our heart is because the supernatural power is not within you and me. It's within God. And he's got this big plan that we can't see or understand or even comprehend or, or, or make sense of. And finding his will for our lives is believing, trusting him with all of our heart, and then not leaning into our own understanding, but just saying, okay, God, I I. I I will trust you that you have a bigger plan, that you are going to take this child, this situation, this conflict. You're going to do something big in it, even though I can't see the end of it right now. Step three, Solomon says in that passage, is in all of your ways, acknowledge him. And there's that word again, all. Not in most of your ways, not in the majority, not in, you know, 95%. In all of your ways, acknowledge him. In other words, to trust God completely in every decision and category in your life, even when it doesn't make sense, even when you can't see around the corner, even if you're not sure what is going to happen. Acknowledge Him in work, in school, in all these things, because part of following, finding God's will, it is realizing that I will just acknowledge God and I will let him take care of the details. I will trust him and let him take care of all of the details. Now in the movie Blindside, there's a great uh, situation where Javier is brought in and he's interviewing for a job. And if you've seen the movie, you know how it goes. But if you haven't, just watch up here on the screen. Good morning, sir. Morning, Mr. Martinez. How are you this morning? Fine, thank you. How are you? I don't know yet. Please, have a seat. I trust you've had time to think about our conversation yesterday. Yes, sir, I did. And what did you decide? Are you on my team? Mr. Tyson, I am very grateful to have a job here. I cannot do as you have asked. And why is that? Because it is wrong, sir. 
It would be dishonoring to my God and my family to lie on that report. Do you understand what this may do to your job here? Yes, sir, I do. Javier, may I shake your hand? Young man, you just gave me the right answer. I've been looking for someone to manage inventory and shipping, and quite frankly, you were the last person on my list. But I need somebody I can trust. Will you take the job? We'll adjust your pay. I would be honored to, sir. Good. Then the job is yours. Now, Walter will go over all the specifics with you, and I'll make the announcement to the staff on Monday. Congratulations, Javier. Oh, and Javier, thanks for your integrity. It's rare. Well done, Javier. After six times, I was getting discouraged. I said that was from the blind side. I was totally wrong. That was from the movie Courageous. But what I love about that situation is when we lean not into our own understanding, but we acknowledge God in everything, he will work things out in ways that we never understood. Javier walked into that, that meeting thinking it was going to go one way, and it went a completely different way. Because God's will was at work in his life. The promise then that comes in this passage is this. It's a if then. Like we talked about step one, step two, step three. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your understanding. Acknowledge him in all your ways. And it says, if you do these things, then God will do something for you. And here it is. He will make your path straight. For us, that, that can be translated, he will show us his will. He will put us in the center of his will if we do those things. Now, what does that mean? It means that God will be with you. That God will... Um, bless and watch over your past and the things that you do. It doesn't mean that your life is going to be easy. It doesn't mean that everything that you want is going to happen. It doesn't mean that all your wishes are going to come true, but instead it means that God is going to be with you and you are going to be in the center of his will. And when the dust settles, that God will have a promise to support you and encourage you and assist you. So finding God's will can be broken down in maybe those three steps and then with that promise. But here's what I want to do. I want to take God's will now, and I want to just kind of break it down into categories for us that are a little easier to understand, okay? Because there's different parts of God's will. The first part of God's will that I want you to see is God's providential will. God's providential will. And that is, what God's providential will is, is what God has decided to do that you and I cannot change, okay? It's just because God is God, he has decided some things to do, and no matter who says he can't do that, who vetoes it, who says, I don't like that, I don't believe that, it doesn't really matter because God is going to do what God is going to do. Let me give you some examples. A plan for salvation. That, that we can accept Christ and be forgiven of all of our sins. That's part of God's providential will. Now, there may be people that don't believe that. Maybe you don't believe that. There are people that can say that it's wrong. There could people, you, you can say, you can have your opinion, but that's God's will. The birth of Jesus, sending his son down, the return of Christ, that God created the earth in six days, that, that the day that you were born on this earth, those are all things that have been part of pro, God's providential will. And you and I cannot change God's providential will. It's just part of who God is. They are not dependent on us. They are not dependent on our obedience or our faith or our belief. But God is just going to do certain things. That's his providential will. Now, the more that you and I become familiar with God's providential will, meaning the more we know it, the more we understand it, the more we accept it, then the easier it's going to be for us to discover God's will in our lives. Because we bring ourselves under this umbrella of providential will. We're like, God, we, I, I know that you have these things, and I believe them, I trust them, and I want to be under them. And so for you and I, we have to become familiar with God's providential will. The second aspect of his will is God's moral will. 
Okay, so you got the providential part. That's the stuff that God's just going to do. It just what makes him God. The moral will is the way God would like us to act or behave. Okay, what, what he wants from us as far as how we interact, how we live, the things that we say, how we treat people, the things that we do. And examples of God's moral will would be the Ten Commandments. I mean, you don't have to ask or wonder about those things. God's word reveals his moral will to us. I mean, God, should I lie? God, do you think it's okay if I rob a bank? God, do you think it, it, that uh, I should read my Bible? Should, should I love my enemy? God, what do you, should I forgive the person who's hurt me? We don't have to ask those questions. You don't have to say, I don't really know if God wants me to do that or not. Because God's moral will, we can go to Scripture, we, we can hear from other people who are, are other believers and find God's moral will of how God wants us to act and behave. It's not a mystery. It's part of God's will. Let me give you a couple examples, and these are just two that I pulled out. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3, it says, It is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 15, For it is God's will that by doing good you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish men. The Bible's full of things that are God's will, for uh, moral will, the way he wants us to act and behave. Now, as a pastor, it's interesting, as I've been in ministry, people often ask pastors questions that are like the trick questions, you know, they kind of want to like try to like get you in a corner and, and ask you some kind of question, but a lot of times they're not that tricky. A lot of times it's because we as humans decide what we want the answer to be, and then we look for some way to justify it. Am I the only one that does that? Like anybody else out there do that? So we're looking for this answer. We know what we want the answer to be, and so now we're looking for uh, building a case to justify. But many times if we're open and honest and we look at for God's will, it, it is right there it, it revealed in God's word. I've had people ask me, as I've been a pastor, like, do you think it's okay for me and my boyfriend to live together? I've had people say, do you think it's okay to divorce my spouse just because I'm not, I'm not really happy? I've had people say, do you think God really wants me to tithe, like to give 10% of my money? I mean, that's a lot of money. Do you think God really, is that, is that what he really wants me to do? God has already answered all of those questions. Okay, you and I may be looking for a wiggle room, looking for ways to get out of it. We may not like the answer. We may not like what we know is true. But God's moral will many times can be pretty black and white if we will open up ourselves to it. So the more familiar be you become with God's moral will, the easier it is to discern God's will and his plan for your life. Now, the third aspect of God's will is his personal will. And that's the part that a lot of us like to camp in and think about. So you've got God's providential will, God's moral will, and God's personal will. And God's personal will would be things like, do I take that job? You know, do I marry this girl? Should I move to that city? Do, do I buy, you know, do I buy a new car? Do I just keep the car that I have? Um, should I stay at home, be a stay-at-home mom, or should I go back to work? Uh, just questions that you and I ask and wrestle with all the time in looking for God's will. It's called God's personal will. And the good news is that God is interested in those things. God cares about those. Even to the smallest details of our life, I believe God cares about them. But here's the important part. And we're going to put this up on the screen. I want you to, to not lose this part. The more familiar you become with the providential will of God, and the more obedient you become to the moral will of God, the easier it will be to discover the personal will of God. Does that make sense? Many times we want the third one, but we don't want to deal with the first two. But God's moral will, God's providential will, you need to be familiar with it. You need to understand it. You need to believe it and be under that umbrella. Then, then God's moral will, you need to be obedient to it. And when you are familiar with the providential will and obedient to the moral will, then it's going to be much easier to discover God's personal will for our lives. So I got a quick question. This is a little quiz, but you can't answer the quiz unless you're 18 years old or under, okay? So if you're older than that, you just have to be quiet, all right? 
I want to show you something. If you're 18 years or younger, I want you to tell me what this is. Anybody? The teenagers in the room. Okay, let's say if you're 40 or younger, you can, you can shout out the answer if you know what it is. A pointy thing on a line. That's a very good description. It's not the technical term for it. Okay, anybody out there? Can anybody tell me what this is? Plum Bob. All the old school people. All the old people. Yeah, all the people that like to eat a Cracker Barrel. And uh, yeah, they all, and don't know how to use their iPhones. They knew exactly what this was, right? It's a Plum Bob. Again, it's not something that we use a lot anymore. I mean, we have digital tape measures. We've got lasers now. We've got, you know, crazy advanced levels. Uh, this is old school. This is the way carpenters, like even you could go back to Jesus' time, and they wouldn't have had one quite this fancy, but a plumb bob is, is, is a concept that they would have used. So here's what a plumb bob does. A builder would use it, and sometimes you'd see a board, and you'd see it hanging from the board because it tells them, what is exactly vertical, okay? So when they're building something, they need to know what's vertical because then they need to be able to go horizontal. And horizontal is completely 90 degrees from vertical, but if you don't know what vertical is, you can't find horizontal. So a plumb bob is, is this device that, that, that tells you, okay, this is exactly true, this is exactly honest, nothing changes or differentiates from this vertically. So then I can know what things uh, I can figure out what horizontal is. So when you're building a building and you, you need the walls to be straight and you want the roof to be level, uh, pl carpenters would use this. So it's a, it's a plumb bob. So now, how does that apply to you and I? Well, God's providential will is kind of like this plumb bob in that when we understand it and when we trust in it, and when we are aware of it and know it, then his m moral will kind of becomes the horizontal to that. And so you got to know the vertical to know the horizontal. God's providential will and moral will are like the vertical and horizontal lines that God gives us, that everything else that God's going to ask us to do will hinge upon his moral will and his providential will. Everything else. So if you don't know the providential will or you're not obedient to the moral will, then it's going to be virtually impossible to find God's personal will in your life. This is the standard. Now, several years ago when my wife, uh, we had our fourth child, and my wife Pam used to direct a, a daycare center at our church. And after we had our fourth, um, she kind of heard God kind of saying, like, I think it's time for you to stay home. Just be a full-time, stay-at-home mom. Don't go back to work, which, which was a big financial decision for us. But I remember us thinking about it, and I remember us talking about it, and all of these things came into play, like, God, show us your will. But to show us his will for that personal part, we had to understand God's providential will. We had to God, understand God's moral will and be obedient to that. And it's in those times when we understand the providential will and the moral will of God, the personal will of God, all of a sudden becomes crystal clear. And God doesn't reveal his personal will until we are under his authority, until we are ready to accept it. And here's why. Okay, this is where a lot of us get tripped up. The real issue is not God's unwillingness, unwillingness to communicate his will. The real struggle for you and I is our unwillingness to follow God's will. You see, God wants me to show, God wants to show me his will. He wants to show you um, his will for your life, for my life. But we say, God, I want you to show me your will so that I can consider if I want to follow it or not. God, I want you to show me, give me some advice here so that I can decide if that's what I really want to do or not. You see, God doesn't play that game. He doesn't work that way. God says, no, 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 no. It doesn't, doesn't happen like that. Okay? This is what I've learned personally and I've seen in the lives of of so many other people. God doesn't give information for consideration or contemplation. He gives it for participation. And you and I are often going, God, I want to know your opinion so that it's an option if I decide to do it. 
And God's like, no, 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 it, it, it doesn't work like that. I'm not going to give you information so that you can consider it, so you can contemplate about it. I'm only going to give you the information when you are at a point where you are actually going to move forward. He doesn't share his will so that you and I can decide whether we want to follow it. He shares his will with us when we are ready to follow it. And God is interested in his will being acted upon, not just thought about. And many times for us, for myself, I want to think about God's will. I'm not ready to act upon it. And this is where it breaks down for a lot of us. It's about obedience. It's about, are we really at the point? And God says, I will wait until you get at the point where, where you say, God, I don't care what the answer is. I don't care what you say. I don't care if it involves pain, discomfort. Whatever it is that you tell me to do, I am ready to do that very thing. And when you get to that point in your life, God's personal will in your life will become crystal clear. It's been my experience in my life. But it's not until you get to the point where you're familiar with God's moral will, you understand you're obedient to the provincial will and the, and the moral will of God, that you will actually hear from God loud and clear. In 2008, I was the lead pastor of a church in Indiana, and uh, there was just a lot of turmoil and a lot of things going on in the church. Uh, but I got to the point where I really felt like God was saying to me, Dan, I'm just, I think I just need you just to kind of walk away from this. Like I asked you to come here and, and, and to serve and you've done that. And now it's just time for you to just kind of walk away. And uh, I got something else for you. I'll take care of you in other ways. But you just need to tell them it's time for you to move on. And I was like, yeah, but God, well, what's the next thing? Like, that's pretty, it, like, it's pretty silly to, like, quit a job and not have another job. I mean, I don't, like, I have uh, a mortgage. I have, you know, kids. I have to put food on the table. So if I just walk away from this, I don't have another plan. I have no plan B. And God was like, that's okay. I, have, I got plan B. And I'm like, God, what is plan B? And God's like, I just need you to do what I say. And then in due time, I will show you what plan B is. And I'm like, God you are making this really, really difficult on me right now. Because we don't like to work like that, do we? We want to know. I want all my ducks in a row. I want to have a plan. I want to be able to know, know what's going to happen. God's like, I just need you to trust me. I just need you to do what I say. I just need you to understand my providential will, be obedient to my moral will, and I will reveal this to you in the right time. And God has this uncanny ability to know when we're ready to obey, when we're ready to listen, when we're ready to actually hear his will and carry it out. So my question today is, for you, is what are you searching for God's direction in? What area of your life are you searching for God's direction? What question do you have that you're looking for an answer for? But before you answer that question, here's what I want you to do. I got two other questions for you first. What action step do you need to take to become more familiar with God's providential will. Because before you ask him about his personal will, before you, you've got the specific thing that you want God to, to answer, what are you doing and what step do you need to take to be more familiar with God's providential will? Maybe that means spending more time in God's word. Maybe that means spending more time praying. Maybe that means getting connected to a small group, getting connected to a community of people that can help you grow and understand and putting yourself under the umbrella of God's providential will and submitting to it. And then the next question is, what action step do you need to take to align yourself with God's will? Even if you don't understand why. Even if it doesn't make sense. Even if God says, well, I want you to break up with that girl. You're like, why? Even if God says, I want you to quit that job. I want you to move out of that house over there. I want you to sell that thing and sell that new car and drive the clunker car. I, I mean, there's all these things that happen where like, but God, that doesn't make sense to me. I mean, you don't understand. Like, I can explain to you why I do what I do, but if God is telling you this is what I want you to do, then what step do you need to take to align yourself to be obedient to God's will? And it's only after that point. It is only after that you take the steps that God wants you to take in his providential will, and you are obedient, and you align yourself under God's moral will, then God's personal will for your life will start to become crystal clear. And it's only at that point where you will see and you will know God's will 
for your life. Let me pray for you this morning. Father, um, we as a people are grateful that you do have a plan for us and that you love us enough that your plan was in a providential way to send your son Jesus to die for us. And Father, for, for people here today, maybe there's the, the person that, um, that the application for this message today is that they would trust you for the first time, that you are who you said you are. You are our father. You did send your son Jesus, and you, he can be accepted and to know him as our Lord and Savior. And for, for the, the person that's here today, I pray that you would just convince them, prompt them that that is the next step. Father, for others of us in here, it's an issue of a moral will. And there are things that we know that you want us to do. There are ways that we need to be obedient. There are things that we need to start doing, we need to stop doing. There are, there are excuses that we need to, need to give up. There are crutches that we need to quit leaning on. There are things that you have prompted us to say over and over or, or do over and over and we have rejected and we have turned away and we've not been obedient. And Father, for that, help us to repent and be truly sorry and know that finding your personal will for our lives is about taking that next step. Father, I thank you that you are a God that does supernatural things. And I've seen that in my life, I've seen that in others' lives, and I've seen that in the life of this church and Father, your church around the world. And today, may we trust that. May we believe it. And may we live lives where we're absolutely in the center of your will because we put ourselves there and we trust you with all of our heart and lean not on our understanding. And we acknowledge you in all of our ways, Father, and allow you to make our paths straight. And that's our prayer in Christ Jesus' name. Amen.